Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, STFC Food Network lecture. And uh, this, this lecture is on shining a light and neutrons on food with our Claire Preci. Um, I've known Claire for a long time and we we're trying to figure out how long it is, but it's interesting to see her, her bio here just to give you a heads up. She is the Deputy Head uh, of, of Industrial Liaison at the Diamond Light Source. Um, that supports companies um, and, and, and a wide ranging of sectors engaging with, with, with um, uh, diamond and, and, and solving real problems. Um, must be quite some time ago, uh, Claire, but Claire Claire's originally was a, a chemist by training. Um, she was a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, USA, um, Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Uh, prior to that, um, she, uh, prior to joining the Leos, and she was um, part of a, a staff scientist at the Saxbeam Beam Line, I22, um, where she specialized in um, self assembly of solutions, gels, soft solids typically addressed um, uh, formulations of issues of pharma pharmaceutical food and consumer products, oil and gas and energy. I think that understates you, Claire, that you've done a lot more interesting things, a lot of other interesting things since then, since I've known you, but uh, look, very looking forward to your talk. Um, Claire's gonna sp speak, speak um, until around about 10 to, and then I'm gonna manage you all with questions. Claire, the fo floor is yours. Oh, one more thing, everybody. Uh, could you please turn um, yourself to mute and um, turn the cameras off? Thank you very much, Claire. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, hi everybody, thank you very much for attending this seminar. I know things are all a bit different at the moment, so thank you for your time. Um, I will say that I, I am giving this talk um, as an overview of Diamond and ISIS and uh, the Central Laser Facility, but I should also acknowledge uh, Dave Clark, Catherine Wellsby and Sarah Rogers, who um, are my counterparts at the different facilities and have contributed to the development of this talk, so thanks to them as well. So today I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of what you can do with um, facility, centrally funded facilities um, in the food sector. Um, because there's a, there's a wealth of possibilities and I hope I can and touch on some of those today. So um, I'm lucky to be the first one in this um, series of S this um, STFC Food Network plus Agri-Food Innovation Seminar webinars with um, the Institute of Food Science and Technology. So I'd like to thank them for this opportunity and also highlight that there's a series. So please watch out for the next one as well. Um, and the Food Network is bringing together STFC researchers and facilities um, and trying to generate and grow a community working in this area. So if you would like to work in this or you're interested in exploring how you could apply your technology or ideas to, to other systems and find collaborators, um, please do contact Food Network and consider joining. We do lots of different things here. I'm involved through the um, scientific facilities, trying to help um, solve problems um, in, this, in this food and agri-science sector. So today I'd like to touch on um, the facilities that are funded um, by STFC. Um, and in Diamond's case, also by the Wellcome Trust as well. And we are, um, there are other facilities, I should say, there's, there's Earth Observatory, there's the Warby Mine, there's the Harwell, um, the Hartree um, High Performance Computing Centre, but I'm, um, among others, but today I'm going to focus on the three that are the big ones that are based at the Harwell Science and Innovation Campus in South Oxfordshire. So um, you can see on the slide here, we have Diamond, which is where I work, which is the very large one that looks like a flying saucer landed in the Oxfordshire countryside. Um, we also have the ISIS neutron and muon source and the central for laser facility. And I'll be telling you a little bit about these different facilities and what we can do there. Um, now I'll start with Diamond because I know it best. Um, I've, um, I've been there 13 years now, so I've known Jeff for a while, but um, Diamond is a little bit older than that, but not much. Um, and it, when built, it was the largest scientific facility built in the UK for over 40 years. And although we are part of the STFC greater family, shall we say, we're um, a separate organisation and we're funded um, by um, STFC, 86%, and also by the Wellcome Trust. So we have a remit to do about 40% life science work because of the involvement of Wellcome. We have about 14,000 scientists using the facilities every year. Granted, the last year was a little bit different, but, um, but we still have an active um, program and we're publishing on average or our users are publishing about the, a thousand papers a year. So it gives you some idea of the scientific output of Diamond. Since we can't visit at the moment, um, I thought you'd just like to have a quick glimpse of what it looks like on the inside. It's a huge round building. 
um, and it's populated by lots of instruments um, represented on this central diagram by all the little navy coloured buildings. Um, these are all what we call our, our experiment our beam lines, uh, where the lines of the X-ray, mainly X-ray beam, come through and we do experiments. Um, just gives you a flavour of what it might look like inside. And what do we do in food research? Well, there's a quite a wide range of analytical approaches that we can take and areas that we work on. Um, so, and those are broadly in, let's say, products and formulations. So we understand about phase behavior, emulsions, suspensions, gels, micelles, things that are forming self-assembled structures in either solution or soft solids. Um, then we start looking at interfaces. So things that are deposited, things that are um, on the edges of materials or containers, um, things that might have um, active properties at interfaces through to complex packaging materials or things that are undergoing um, complex mechanical processing or aging thermal treatments. And then um, um, through to actual processing. So sometimes the, the thing that's interesting is, is how a product or undergoes a process and what happens during that and how we can help understand it better. So diamond mainly produces x-rays. So we also have ultraviolet and infrared, but we're predominantly producing x-rays. And why would you use x-rays? So here we, we would use is your conventional x-ray image that people are familiar with to look at broken bones. We don't do that. Um, but we look into matter and it tries, we try and understand um, structure and dynamics um, and chemistry of materials. And we do that uh, using a variety of um, technique families, if you like. So we have spectroscopic techniques, which tell you about the chemistry of the materials. Um, and that's sort of on the atomic to nanometer scale. Then we move up to diffraction, um, which is telling you more about atomic structure. So you can look at crystalline materials or, or um, powder materials and try to understand more about how the atoms are arranged in space. Then you move up in the length scale and you're in the more nanometer range, you get into scattering, which looks at spatial organization. So these are often from partially ordered materials and um, rather than crystalline materials. So the, the soft um, um, materials and liquids that you might be interested in looking at, right up then to the microns to millimeter size, size range where we're looking using imaging and often tomography to get three dimensional imaging um, about physical microstructure. So that's where we might be looking at cracks voids, bubbles, processing, porosity, some other kind of feature that's happening. Now, I just wanted to highlight a few examples because we've done lots of work in the food area, but unfortunately, some of the x-ray imaging work that we've done, we're not allowed to talk about. So here's some examples of some um, samples that we acquired from a shop. So please, uh, there's no endorsement or, or um, working play. But, but we can say that we've, we've looked at these particular samples to really give you an idea of what you can see. So many of you may be familiar, if you're not from the UK, sorry, I hope you have something equivalent. Um, but we're looking here at some X-ray imaging. So we did some, um, a colleague of mine, Sally Irvine, did some um, radiography and uh, tomographic reconstruction imaging of a whisper bar, which is a, a highly porous, bubbly um, chocolate bar. Um, so you can see here on the left, you can see she's coloured it in, in, in brown, So, but you can start to see the pores and the varying pore sizes from the edge and then all the way through this. And what's interesting is you can do this through the wrapper, you don't have to um, unwrap it, slice it, anything, it's all about an in situ measurement. So you're looking inside a material without damaging it. Um, and you can get information about porosity and structure. On the right hand side, we've got a potato based snack called a pomba which you'll be very familiar with if you have small children. Um, and these are sort of, as you see, teddy-shaped crisps, um, which are very um, porous. So on, the, um, on this uh, image, you can see the different um, pore sizes were segmented. So we could see what the different populations of pores were like, and then how the structure was forming around the pores in this complex geometry that we have here in this shape. Another example here is looking at a peanut covered in chocolate. So on the um, right, you can see an image of a cross section of the, um, of the peanut in the chocolate. We didn't slice it. You can take these cross sections from the tomography images. I'm sorry about the slides. Um, and then um, you can see this interface on the left hand side between the peanut structure and the chocolate. 
And it's actually a very thin layer that in between, but you can start to see how the chocolate cracks, starts forming voids. You can see the brittle nature of it as it's coating the peanuts. So it's quite interesting using this technique to look at hidden interfaces that you can't otherwise probe without damaging them. We've also done some experiments looking at just at, at primary particles, looking at uh, flour, icing sugar, milk powder. So you can see this very different structure helps you identify and process different things um, just by imaging. I'm so sorry about these slides, they keep skipping on without me. Right, so we did um, some work, or some work was done anyway, by uh, Unilever in collaboration with the University of Manchester using one of our instruments. Um, they were looking at um, crystal growth in ice cream. Um, and this is to do with um, temperature cycling because it's a, um, what they call an abuse cycle. So when you buy it, you put it in your car, you take it home from the shops and it sort of thaws a bit, you put it back in your freezer, it freezes again. Sorry, I don't know what's happening with the timing. I took off all of the um, animation, but it's clearly going a bit funny. Um, so in those time periods where you're thawing the product and then refreezing it, it's giving opportunity for the ice crystals to, um, to grow and extend and change the microstructure. And changing is in microstructure results in a difference in taste. So they were really interested in understanding how this microstructure of ice cream changes over um, temperature cycling from minus 20 to minus seven and then back again. And they used our imaging beamline to probe that in detail. One of the other works we've done um, was with Roth and Stead Research, um, looking at mineral distribution in wheat grain. So this is quite different. So we did a, this was a cross section and um, we could do some elemental mapping. But with x-rays, we can access most of the periodic table, which gives you access to a wide range of different um, elements that you can access. But then when you found your element, you can sort of zoom in and do some more complicated um, spectroscopic measurements if the concentration is high enough to understand something about the local structure and bonding of that element. So not only do you get the, the fact that the element itself is present, um, so example, iron or zinc, but you can tell something about the oxidation state, its nearest neighbors and how it's bonded. So you can tell what kind of form it's taking and whether or not that might be bioavailable. In, in this case, that's what they were interested in studying. They were trying to um, breed a uh, complex wheat that was able to have bioavailable um, iron and other minerals in the part of the wheat grain that people actually eat to make bread, rather than it being in the husk that was removed. One of the pieces of work we've done with some uh, collaborators recently was through the Newton Fund. So this was with some, um, some colleagues in Thailand who worked at the Thai Synchrotron and with their industrial collaborators to understand a, um, a chemical speciation in uh, heme-like substitutes. So these are materials that they use for flavoring meat analogs like, like tofu and things like that, um, to try and make them have a more meat-like flavor to make them more appealing to their mass markets who want to eat meat, but also want to have a more environmentally friendly and healthier um, meat substitute to eat. So this work was, was done around flavorings for foods um, to try and understand the, the chemistry of the, of the production process and, um, and how it was affecting this eventual flavor. So that's a touch on, on some of the things that we can do at Diamond. It's a bit of a whistle stop tour today, I'm afraid. Um, but next I'd like to just highlight some activities taking place at the central laser facility, which is sort of in the middle of this picture. The central laser facility is spread across many buildings, so it's hard to pinpoint it exactly. But essentially it produces, it, it provides a very um, broad suite of um, state-of-the-art laser-based facilities which go from very fast lasers to very high powered lasers and then advanced imaging um, systems. Um, so it has some of the most intense laser beams, um, but it can also do a wide range of different um, visualization microscopy type experiments. So, it, so all of those applications of laser based technology. These are the in, um, main um, facilities that the central laser facility offers to users. So we have the very high power the, um, and the very, very fast lasers, which can do lots of um, different types of, of experiments and novel techniques that perhaps are not accessible in the lab. Um, and then these are also coupled with um, um, laser systems that are set up to be applied in the physical and life sciences to do characterization. So you, you have the extreme applications end and you also have the very super high resolution 
threatened to microscopy um, aspects as well. So in agri-tech and food science, what kind of things do they do? They work in photochemistry, they understand the structures of micelles, aerosols, spores, they do chemical fingerprinting, they're looking at understanding soil and minerals um, and crops. So it's a wide area of, um, of research in this field. So fundamentally, these techniques tend to boil down to two main classes. So you have spectroscopy, where you're understanding the molecular um, information from your sample in real time and probing that with um, dynamics. And you have microscopy, where we're looking at, at very high resolution imaging of materials. You can do single molecule tracking in real systems. Um, and, and so that leads to sort of structure determination, high resolution fluorescence and imaging, uh, these kind of applications. And some of the examples that I'm highlighting today, uh, one was a work they did um, in collaboration with the Coconut Collaborative, whose product you may have seen in your local supermarket. Um, they are the UK's biggest producer of coconut-based yogurt. Um, and the work that they did was looking at early stage rancidity. So they were losing, Coconut Collaborative were unable to detect at an early enough stage on, on, on whether or not uh, rancidity was occurring in some of their raw materials. And it was leading to wastage um, in their production process. And so they uh, worked with um, the central laser facility to develop a new system for detecting this rancidity at an earlier stage in raw materials. So they were able to not use those materials, only the suitable ones. And then they had um, improved shelf life and better processing. So they estimate it, it saved them about half a million pounds doing this work. So um, it's a very good system for, uh, for quality control in, in manufacturing. One of the pieces of work that has been a real success out of the central laser facility is um, this particular technology. This is called Spatially Offset Raman. Um, it was launched as a spin-off company by Cobalt called Cobalt and has been acquired by Agilent Technologies now. Um, and it's a way of detecting um, trace materials inside containers. So it's very good for looking at, at trace contaminants or trace materials in, in big batches of food processing processing for the manufacturing industry, for food in particular, but it's also been used, um, you'll see them in airports if we're ever allowed back again, uh, they're used in airport scanners um, and various other um, security applications to try and detect um, trace materials. Um, the central laser facility have also collaborated with PepsiCo looking at the structure of pe uh, potato and potato products. Um, I don't have particular details on that. Um, I'm sure you'll understand that's quite um, confidential, but they've been working in that area looking at um, imaging microscopy. And they've also been working with Syngenta, looking at um, development of catalysts. So this is a um, catalysis is very important in, in manufacturing, particularly pharmaceuticals or agrochemicals. So you want to make them maximum efficiency because you want your agrochemical to um, be used at very low concentrations. Um, you want to develop it in a very cost-effective manner. They typically can be quite expensive to manufacture. Um, so this is this uh, work in looking at how to optimize a catalyst to only produce the products that you really want and reduce the waste products that you're forming as a result of this um, is really quite important. So, so here there's some um, Academics from the University of York have been working in collaboration with um, scientists from the Central Laser Facility and Syngenta Crop Protection to understand um, the um, reaction intermediates. Now, the, the clever thing was that they used the um, ultra laser system here and they could capture information from the PICO system up to the milliseconds in time frame. So you could capture really early reaction intermediates right the way through to the reaction um, endpoint that you might see. And the, the statistic I quite liked about this is that that's the equivalent. So from picoseconds to milliseconds and seconds is the equivalent of looking at an, a reaction that goes from one second to three years. So that gives you with those decades of time. So it really gives you a sense of, of what's achievable in those, um, those early stages and late stages of, of reaction kinetics. So now I'd like to have a, just a brief overview of this is the um, Isis and muon source. So here in the foreground in this image, you, with the black, with the blue thing that sort of curves around in it, that's that's part of Isis. Um, 
The ice is in the foreground here, diamonds at the back, um, central laser facility is in the middle. Um, and ISIS is the um, neutron and muon source. So here it's, um, it produces um, neutrons, um, which are used um, for a variety of techniques. In many ways, it's, um, it's quite complementary to what we do at the synchrotron and diamond. We have access to similar techniques like diffraction um, and imaging. Um, but it, it's a different probe, so it, it's complementary rather than competitive. You might choose to do both for a project, for example. Um, one of the very interesting things about neutrons is that they're highly penetrating. They have a magnetic moment, so they're good for probing magnetic materials. Um, they're quite weak, so they don't really interact with the material very much. They don't cause much damage. Um, and um, one of the, the most interesting things about them is the, the contrast. So here we're talking about hydrogen deuterium contrast. I'll mention that in a minute. So here we have, on the left, you've got a, a typical X-ray image. Um, so you can see there's um, soft tissue. The X-rays will pass through soft tissue, but be slightly attenuated. So you see it's sort of slightly fuzzy. Um, it's completely blocked by the jewelry, the ring and the, the bracelets. So you can't, you can't see through those, they, they shine up really bright. You can see different bits of the bone and you get the bone structure. So on an X-ray, this is, this is going to tell you um, about the different elements. And, and pretty much as the, as the Z number increases, you get um, a, a more dense element, you, know, you, you can see them, they shine up more easily on, on an X-ray image like this. With neutrons, it doesn't work that way. The um, neutron um, cross section is is quite different, and it isn't necessarily following a pattern you might predict. So, for example, there's a big difference in with hydrogen compared to deuterium. Um, with other elements, the yeah, the neutrons don't interact very much and pass straight through. So, so it it involves the the right elements, but you can get a very very powerful probe through. So. Um, it's particularly powerful for looking at hydrogen or water in systems because you have this sensitivity. Other elements as well, but, but hydrogen is one of the ones it's, it's most uh, well known for. And one of the examples here is that you saw the previous image, which was, which was a hand, an X-ray of a hand wearing jewellery. Now this one is uh, the classic neutron image, which is a picture of a rose, which you can see in clear definition here. Um, but the container it's in is a lead casket. Now, if that was an X-ray, it would never pass through. If it was just um, light from a torch, you wouldn't be able to see through it. But with neutrons, you can see through the lead, straight through the lead, but it is blocked by the rose. So you start to see information about the rose and the rose's structure. And um, you can see the leaves, you can see the, um, um, the, the details of the petals, but you, you can see straight through the lead. So you see it's an interesting um, probe of materials. And what that means is that you can use some clever chemistry to selectively match out pieces of your, com your component system. So you can selectively deuterate um, some of the chemical materials. So in this case, we're looking at, let's say, um, an, um, a micelle, and you can selectively deuterate the core, the um, surfactant, or the surrounding fluid. So you can gradually build up a picture of, of what you're looking at by just looking at um, um, deuterated material versus non-deuterated material. So here on the bottom, you can see how roughly how that works. You would do these three different experiments and put the information together afterwards. And some of the examples that we would highlight here are looking at how pesticides protect crops. So they've done some work where they've made a model of a leaf's um, waxy surface. So just like you would have in wheat crops, and now looking at how surfactants interact with that um, model surface um, to try and understand surfactant penetration and how it would how it absorb onto the surface of the leaf. Um, and it gives you information for modeling how that interaction might happen in, in other systems. Another example is looking at aggregation of wheat proteins. So in this case, they, the people are doing the work, um, so the reference is, is here on the slide, we're looking at small amphiphilic proteins that are found within um, barley and wheat. Um, and but it's um, believed that they have a role in texture of wheat and, and possibly looking at seed defense. So it's, it's quite interesting to, and important to understand how it is that they aggregate and form um, these larger scale structures. And so here, the group did some um, 
small angle neutron scattering to look at how the monomers, so the individual um, uh, proteins, um, um, self-assemble to form these larger micelles, which are, are not spherical, these elongated ellipsoidal um, micelles. And using um, small angle neutron scattering, they were able to um, identify and define the size and shape of the micelles that were, were discovered. Now, they've also done some work looking at dairy products. So in this case, they're looking at, at um, milk. Um, so it's looking at, at how um, aggregates form. In particular, as you can see, these are sort of fractal aggregates. So these are larger scale aggregates that you would find um, in yogurts or curd, which would be much larger than those found in milk. Um, and this technique that's available, Spinner Co Sans uh, Isis, is, is able to detect these particles and see them at um, this much larger length scale. So you can just try to understand some, some structural information from these, um, these dairy materials. And it would lead to, to understanding about um, shelf life and therefore stability over longer periods. Um, one of the other things you can do with neutrons, because I mentioned about the hydrogen um, deuterium sensitivity, you can start to look at the specific interactions of, of hydrogen. And so here, this was a diffraction study um, looking at hydration and sweetness. So there are a range of different sugar sugars here on the right, the structures are seen, um, which all slightly vary, but have different sweetness profiles. Um, and so the work was done looking at, at hydration around the sugar molecules. Um, so really understanding this on, a, on an atomic structural basis, trying to really understand how the, hyd the hydration of the sugar affects what happens and why they really behave differently. So they could get these hydration maps of the different sugars so that they could understand that further. So, sorry, I've clearly finished a little bit fast. Um, so I just wanted to touch on, on what was possible with um, central facilities and give you some examples of things that, that could be done. Now we have a wide range of different options. I mean, at Diamond, um, the techniques have come under the uh, diffraction spectroscopy and imaging. At the central laser facility, it's, it's often sort of spectroscopy and microscopy. Um, and ISIS tends to have perhaps maybe less of the spectroscopy, but more of the imaging and the diffraction and the scattering type techniques. And we can certainly help advise on which might be the best approach. What tends to happen when people approach some of the central facilities is they have a problem in mind and, and we welcome that. We'd like to work on a problem based approach. So if you can bring us an idea of something you'd like to do or you're interested in understanding further, we can help identify which kind of technique we would suggest as a good approach for that, how we would then um, consider experiments in that area and, and which, which techniques might work in tandem. Um, so although we do work, let's say independently, we also collaborate together. So we could um, advise you which of the facilities, if not more than one, would be most suited to your problems that you have. Now, each of the facilities has different access um, options and mechanisms. Um, there's a free access option to all of them if you're willing to publish. Um, there are also um, paid for options if you've got proprietary uh, work that you, you need to keep confidential. Um, and there are sometimes some in-between options as well. So, but those vary from facility to facility. So it's best to contact us directly for more up-to-date information. Um, but I hope that that's given you a bit of a flavor of um, the types of work that we can do, the range of possibilities and has made you think, oh, maybe we've got something that we should talk to them about. And if so, I would please encourage you to um, reach out, talk to us and, um, We'll see if we can possibly help. So thank you very much. Excellent, Claire. Thank you very much for that. And it's always good to see that. It's always good to catch up. And um, that's fantastic, isn't it? I mean, that's tip of the iceberg, really. And, and you're, you're always doing more and more every, every time, you and, and you and all the others. And I would also add, um, please take a look at the STFC Food Network. It's food and agriculture and all sorts of things. And as it's ongoing, lots of lots happening there. Gareth, um, we, we'll, we'll, we'll possibly put that up later. Um, yeah. I was just going to do a punt for Jens, who's next oh, in the um, seminar series. Um, and then I think that's me, me done. Great. Thank you very much, Claire. So how this is going to work, um, I'd like you to put some questions up in the chat and then and I'll, I'll draw, draw them to Claire's attention. 
um, and we'll, we'll go that way if you don't mind. So um, keep it keep it keep it short and sweet, um, and and uh, and uh, obviously no long monologues, please. Um, so looking for questions in the chat, please. Otherwise, I'll just talk. <laughs> so um, we have. Um, I mean, we have so many different things. I mean, if you have a thousand papers published every year, there are so many examples. Um, so there are plenty of, of um, papers and publications on the website um, to, um, to have a look at if you're interested in different areas or we can help guide you in that. But Claire, can you see the chat? Is it, Mark, Mark? I can. Do you have to use deuterated water to study sugar hydration? I don't know. So this is um, a neutron um, experiment, but... Um, so the work that was done was doing deuterated, but I don't honestly know whether they were using um, um, deuterated water or whether they were using deuterated sugars, um, because um, you need to have some element of the deuteration to um, in, induce the contrast, um, which is what you're, you're probing for. Um, but I don't know which way around they did it or whether they had to do it both ways and there was selective and deuteration along the molecule as they went along. I suspect it was quite a complex process. Um, ISIS does have a deuteration facility, so there are scientists who can help advise on what needs to be done and help you do it. Um, and those would be the best people to talk to about, about that kind of work. And I can certainly put you in touch, or I suggest you contact Sarah Rogers, um, who's here, or I think I saw Graham Appleby was present. So Graham, if you want to put your email in the chat, um, then people can get in touch with you that way as well. And that's appreciated. I mean, you, you and Sarah and all the rest are all, all trying to do their day jobs and then trying to help us do this as well. So it's, that's, that's appreciated. Please just, uh, and thank, thank you, Graham. Okay, more questions, please. Don't be shy. Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> so it says typically mass spectroscopy is used to assess hydrogen deuterium exchange of proteins to understand scaffold characteristics. Can you do that by neutrons without protein digestion? I do not know. Um, I'm afraid that's going to be a question for the specialists. I'm not a neutron person, so I couldn't, I couldn't ask, I'm afraid. But um, can I suggest that you contact Sarah Rogers um, or Graham um, and they, they are the neutron people. They will have much more understanding of specific technical details than I do. I would hate to tell you the wrong thing. And that, that's the advantage of being part of the network, I would add. Um, but yeah. you, you get to go to the events and have these conversations. And that's how it all starts. So uh, in, in between the great lectures that we get and, and the events and the sand pits, and then over, over, over the, you know, the inevitable dinners and things like that, these things go on. Another question there from Graham. So, um, so in Graham's question, did my X-ray images of things like chocolate-covered peanuts and chocolate bars actually help people change? No, because those particular images were done so that we could demonstrate to people what the facilities can do. Those particular experiments, we, when we do work on behalf of our clients, the work is confidential. So I've got no examples of that that I'm allowed to show you. So we spent some time to give some examples of some materials that we went out and bought so you could see what's achievable using um, that as a, as a technique. Um, but then um, it, it's not wildly dissimilar from work that we have done on behalf of commercial clients where we, we have helped them to understand um, how production processes of influence structure, for example, how um, porosity changes between different products how um, different processing conditions lead to different microstructures and how we track that back. Um, and, and when people are developing new types of materials to understand how that's working. So yes, we do this on behalf of industrial clients, um, lots, um, but unfortunately I am not at liberty to share that information. So, sorry, I've seen some other ones. Um, so, is uh, can you visualize phase changes as a function of temperature? Yes. Um, so it depends what you mean by phase change. I mean, when you're doing X-ray imaging, you can see um, the crystal growth and melting. So that's a sort of phase change. You can see the, the growth of these crystallites. Um, so it, that's what happened in, these, in the recrystallization of ice cream experiment, that you could see that the crystallites grew with time. So 
and they started off when the when the product was was very fresh as very very small crystallites but over time through multiple freeze thaw cycles the crystallites grew larger and that's what changed the um the mouthfeel so if you imagine you felt it yourself like after a while if you've thawed and frozen your ice cream quite a lot it tastes a bit crunchy and that crunchy texture is coming from very large ice crystals so what they want to do is try and avoid that um, so it's a, it's trying to to find ways of understanding what's happening in the project so that you can go back and and amend it to try and improve it. Um, but we have also done this phase behaviour, um, not through imaging, you can do it through diffraction and scattering. So for example, there are a number of, of other materials that go through phase behaviour that's, that's very important to their structure and function. And we can probe that um, with techniques like small angle scattering. So um, for example, chocolate's well known. Um, you can look at different phases of chocolate and how um, uh, you can do work in this area. Um, people have done work in, um, in lots of cocoa butter and, and different types of, of probes, but they've also used different techniques for looking at that. There's some work that's just out recently looking about foams that they've made with uh, cocoa butter rather than, so you're reducing the calorie content, but still retaining the mouthfeel. Um, so there's a lot of, of work in, in this kind of structure, microstructure, um, that, that's applicable that could be used for dyeing for that. Um, so for the X-ray CT, can you give me some idea of speed and resolution limits for imaging? Can we image in real time during heat and mixing? Yes, um, you can. Um, the, we have the very high, re high speed camera and we have high resolution. It's a bit of a trade-off with imaging, whether you choose the highest resolution or the highest speed, because you have to, highest, you've got restricted field of view. And if you want 3D imaging at the same time, you've got to allow time for it to revolve. Um, but if, you're, if you want to do heating and mixing, that's possible. We just might need, we don't necessarily have the, um, the baking equipment. So if you want to bake bread, for example, and look at how the bread structure changes during baking, we might not have the bread oven. So we might need to be able to work with you to construct something that would fit on one of our instruments so that we could then probe it while the bed, bread was breaking. But there's no reason why we couldn't do, we do, we do a lot of mixing loops with, um, with liquids and there's no reason we, we couldn't do that with a, with a mechanical mixing process as well. This so is, it's, this it's been, impossible by design. This has been discussed at, at, at some of our meeting, our um, events about putting, um, uh, uh, food processing and ovens and such things in the beam lines. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, you know, and we've even in, in the time we've had the network. Um, not one of the network members, but I've seen a greenhouse go on the on the um, on, on, on the uh, the ice uh, next to the ISIS beam line. So all these things are possible. You've got to just got to say you want them, and then people like me will go around and say it's a thing. Um, yeah, I mean, we we have scientists who are very imaginative and they like a challenge. Um, and, and their job is to facilitate other people's experiments. So they will try their best to try and get anything on these instruments and trying to make it work. Um, so we are certainly happy to try and incorporate it. It's just that if you come to us and say, have you got a specific gadget that does this? The chances are we don't have one ourselves. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't incorporate yours or work with you to develop something that would fit onto our instrumentation and allow us to do that. Because anything that you know hasn't really been done before or would be exciting to look at is something that we'd be you know our scientists tend to be interested in doing and trying to look at and find a solution for so yes I mean one of the things that particularly with the synchrotron you're looking because we our measurement times are very fast um, you can monitor processes much more than you can with a lab instrument which are much slower to measure so the advantage of having a massive synchrotron is that you get you get very fast and very high resolution data so that lets you look at dynamic processes. So you can look at something while it's changing, rather than just a before and afterwards. You look at it during and try and understand what, what's happening to the, the microstructure or, or the chemistry during that process. Um, and if it needs specific conditions to make it do that, you know, I mean, when, in chemistry, we might say it needs to be heated to 700 degrees and then the gas flowed across it. But you know, if you're baking bread is the example, or you're, I don't know, whatever it is you're interested in doing, microwaving something. Um, as long as you can, as we can together, create that environment so we can make a little oven that goes on the beam line or we can, or a big one, um, or, a, or we can replicate um, this microwave technology or 
whatever it is that makes your sample do something interesting, um, we can try and replicate that on, on a beam line so we can use it as a probe. So yes, it's totally possible. Um, we've got a wide range. We've got some excellent technicians. We've got um, a lot of, of fantastic scientists who are willing to spend time trying to make these things work. We need the ideas, but we might need some um, technical input and, and, and maybe even some kit from, from your side because we just we don't have all of the food industry's kit as well as everything else that we have. So, um, and just because we haven't done it before doesn't mean we couldn't do it, it's just it might not have come up before. So do talk to us about it because we do all sorts of uh, complex in situ experiments. So we've got quite a lot of expertise in that area. So, uh, John, are there any alternative protein companies working on the Howell campus? I do not know. Yeah, um, have we got anybody in the, in the network? Um, I don't know if there are um, anyone in the network who is working in that yeah, field. Yeah, we, we, we do. We have a few scorpion projects working in the area. Um, so, um, so I'm sure, John, if you get in touch, I'm sure we can make some introductions for you. Um, and then we've got a, a just a, a shout out for Jens is talking about data science and food in the next of the ser this series. Um, so we've got um, plenty of opportunities to talk. I mean, the food, the food network as a whole um, is aimed at trying to bring together um, people who are working in the sector to try and look at, at things that they may not have looked at before or work together in different ways. And so I'd really encourage you to, to have, a, have a look at that. Um, and if there's something about facilities particularly that um, strikes you as, as interesting and you have some projects in mind or some technical queries, I realize this might not be the right forum, um, but we can um, certainly help. I mean, it's, and it's also totally possible to put NDAs or whatever in place so you can feel comfortable discussing things in a more confidential manner. Um, but at, at Diamond, certainly we're working with 140, I think it is now, companies across 19 countries. So it's a, you know, we've been doing this a long time. And so we do understand some of the pressures and, and how to go about it and what, what might be important for you. Um, because that varies whether you're a big company or a small company, there are different pressures and different um, aspects to consider. Um, so I would, I would say, please do get in touch. Uh, my email's right there. Um, and we'd be very happy to discuss um, there's no pressure. You just, uh, if you've got a complex problem, complex characterization issue, just um, give us a call or an email and we can see if there's anything we can do to help. And if we can't, we'll tell you that too, which is also helpful, you know, rather than starting down the wrong track. But, but we might also have a, a suggestion of which way to go. So sometimes it's a useful starting point. You know, do, you, do you know what we could do in this area? And we could say, well, no, we don't, but we know who to ask. And sometimes it's a sort of a signposting thing. Um, but we we know quite a lot of people as well. So, um, so yeah, so please do get in touch. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, you can see the recording is going to be there. Just to reinforce what Claire's saying about uh, the commercial side of it, not allowed to speak, to speak about because we have NDAs and all sorts of things. But the food network, our, our network has got what? Gareth, over well over a thousand now, isn't it? And a third of them are industry, including memberships from DEFRA, FSA, and other institutions. Now they aren't there for a laugh; they're there because things are happening. The problem always, of course, is to get the technology out there in the commercial sector. But we have good relationships with Innovate and other and others. And in these difficult times, we're still having some very strong conversations with, with, with about taking the projects forward. And the network introduces people and helps you do that. Um, but. Um, Careful not to overpromise, Gareth, because I know you're busy. Um, but, um. Yeah, no, it's uh, we we do, and actually the the membership is increasing quite rapidly at the moment as well, Jeff. So I, I think over the new year we were aiming for one thousand members. That's now already one thousand uh, one hundred, and it's it's growing quite quickly. So it's it's events like this that are doing that. So it's great to have people along, and that's what we exist is to put SDFC people in touch with research and and industry and. Uh, the agri-food sector. So if you have, um, if, you, if, you, if you're looking for specialist expertise, we can put you straight in touch with someone like Claire. If you're looking for general contacts and just want to want, want a starting point, by all means, get in touch with me. Um, I'll put my email address um, in the chat box just now. 
and um, happy to do introductions for people if you'd like to get to know more about the network. Okay, so um, Gareth, it looks like it's all it's all starting to to go quiet. Um, uh, I'm just going to pause for another an, an, another thirty seconds and see if anybody's got any last burning questions. All quiet. Looks okay, like. Well, time. thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. I really appreciate it, and um, I hope that it was interesting. And if you have anything, do get in touch. Um, or you can follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn and you'll follow news stories that way as well. And uh, this, the Food Network have LinkedIn presence as well. So, so it's a low key way of getting involved. Great. Some thanks coming in, Claire. And thanks, thanks for me and myself. And, and, and you're, always, you're always stepping up and I appreciate it because I know you're very busy. Um, and I'm, I will ask you again, of course.